Before we write any test, we should always think about what we hope to achieve and the return on investment from this test, because nothing we do as engineers is free, including the test that we decide to write. There is the cost in terms of the engineering time it takes to write the test, and the more tests we have, the more test code we have to read. And although it may give you this fussy feeling when you have lots of tests, you might not feel so great when you have to make a change that requires you to change some implementation code, but also change a lot of your tests. So having lots of tests can have a maintenance cost as well. Not to mention, the more tests you have, the longer it's going to take to run. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't write tests. Just that you need to understand the cost of having those tests and what value you're getting in return. And in terms of testing, first and foremost, we want to be able to catch problems before they actually happen, when the cost of fixing those problems are going to be much much higher. And when we find a problem, we can write tests against them to make sure that those problems don't regress in the future. And tests can help us gain confidence about our software that is actually going to work as we intended once it's running in the wild. And as Goyko explains in his book *Specification by Example*, which is linked below, your tests can also be a living, breathing specification of how your software is intended to work. And when you have well-written test cases, one can look at your test cases and understand how your system is supposed to behave. And before you do anything, you should understand the return on investment on what you're doing. And I have seen far too many teams spend a lot of time writing and maintaining tests that don't really give them the return on investment in terms of confidence about how their software is actually working. So before we write any code, including writing new test cases, we should think about what we are really testing and are we getting good return on investment for the effort that we are about to put into writing these tests. And it's not just about having a lot of tests. Sometimes more is actually less. And it's also not about having some arbitrary percentage in terms of test coverage. Test coverage just tells you the percentage of lines of code that's been covered by your test, not all the different cases that can actually happen in production. Even if you have 100% test coverage, it doesn't mean that you've covered every single scenario that can happen. Say, if an exception was to happen, do you have the code that handles that exception? If not, maybe you should. But test coverage is not going to tell you that. So 100% test coverage doesn't mean that you're bug-free. It just means that your test cases covers all the lines of code that you've actually written. Nothing more, nothing less. If you consider this really simple architecture with an API gateway in front of Lambda, which writes some data to DynamoDB, even in something simple like this, there's still a lot of different ways that these can fail. For example, maybe we've misconfigured the API endpoint. Maybe with the wrong HTTP method, or we've misspelled the query string parameter, or maybe we're missing or have misconfigured the Lambda permission here, so API Gateway is not able to invoke the Lambda function. Or maybe we have some business logic bugs in the Lambda function code, or maybe we just haven't configured the DynamoDB name and passed it into the Lambda function as environment variable. Or perhaps we forgot to add the IAM permissions for the function to be able to perform the put item action against this DynamoDB table. Maybe we've also misconfigured the schema for the table. Maybe we've misspelled one of the attributes. Or maybe we are missing an index on the table. There are a lot of different places that this simple piece of setup can actually fail. And the classic literature on testing is that you should have a test pyramid. Where the width of each section tells us how many tests we should have. So based on this, we should have lots of unit tests, fewer integration tests, and even fewer end-to-end -end tests. But as we discussed already, there are a lot of places where this simple setup can fail, and most of them have got nothing to do with our code, and has more to do with how our resources has been configured and how our Lambda functions interacts with them. And if we focus most of our testing effort with unit tests that only looks at our Lambda function, then for sure we can identify those business logic problems that we may have. But we're also going to miss out on most of the problems that can actually happen in the wild and affect our users' experience with our system. Which is why when it comes to microservices, 
And this certainly applies to serverless applications as well. The test honeycomb makes far more sense, whereby you have fewer unit tests because your code has become simpler and you don't get a lot of value from those unit tests. Most of the complexity and problems lie outside of your code, around how your code interacts with other services, which is why we need to have a lot more integration tests. We still want to have those end-to-end -end tests because they test the whole system and give us the most confidence that our software actually works. But they take longer to execute, and we still want to have a decent feedback loop. So we will have fewer end-to-end -end tests as well. And looking at what we have here, an end-to-end -end test will test the whole thing from beginning to end by interacting with the API just as a user would. This end-to-end -end test is slower to execute, and we have to deploy everything to AWS before we can actually run them. So before we do that, we can run some integration tests that focus on how our code integrates with DynamoDB and still get a good confidence that this Lambda function is going to work. And we can still write unit tests to check any domain logic inside our function and use mocks to help test them in isolation. But since most Lambda functions are really quite simple, in my experience, unit tests just don't have a very good return on investment when it comes to serverless. So it makes sense to have fewer of this and instead focus more of our effort on writing integration tests where we're likely to get the biggest bang for our buck.